Hey folks, this is Riker with another Diablo lore video. In today's episode, we explore the Age of Faith, the era that began after the Mage Clan Wars. This is part 8 in the series where we explore the major players in the story of Diablo, from the Nephilim to Tyriel to Deckard Cain to Diablo himself. And we give a crash course on what exactly is going on story-wise in this franchise. Now before we dive in, I'll just quickly remind you that today is the last day to get your name on the Rikers Raiders 2018 t-shirt. Details in the video description on how to do that. Now be sure to check out our previous episodes in this lore series if you haven't, and make sure to have subscription notifications turned on to be alerted of new episodes. In our last episode, we spoke about the age of magic that arose to replace religion which the people of Sanctuary had enough of after the Sin Wars. We discussed the Mage Clan Wars that put an end to the Age of Magic and broke people's faith in magic. And today we'll talk about how people once again turned to religion. Because, eh, I'm sure religion can't be as bad as everyone remembers. Let's give it another shot. So with people now having turned against the Mage Clans, lots of arcane literature, tomes and scrolls filled with lore were destroyed. Presumably through burning. They didn't have paper shredders back then. The people rioted, looting and destroying mage fortresses in an act of anarchy rivaled only by hockey fans after the Stanley Cup. The only mage stronghold to survive was the Ishari Sanctum, the former headquarters of the mage clans. You'd think that would be the one place they'd want to destroy. To this day, the Ishari Sanctum in Chaldeum, that's the Act 2 hub in Diablo 3, remains the greatest symbol of mage power. So, again, kinda weird that they didn't tear that down. Now, some mage clans survived this mage apocalypse, albeit in a greatly diminished form. And that's largely thanks to them going into hiding. Contrary to popular belief, you can both run and hide. Now, the Vigeri, Vigeri, the mage clan responsible for just about every bad thing that a mage has ever caused, were among those that managed to survive. But they pinky swore to never again summon demons into sanctuary and instead focus on elemental magic. Laws were passed to prohibit the use of magic, particularly dark magic, since, you know, prohibition has always been a very successful means of completely eliminating a certain activity. But I suppose this prohibition was slightly more successful than the average prohibition because it was enforced by the Viz Jaktar, aka the Order of the Mage Slayers, aka Assassins. Yes, the very same assassin that you play as in Diablo 2 is a member of the Viz Jaktar. And Natalia, the NPC that you meet in Diablo 2 when you first meet her, is a member of the Viz Jaktar. But that won't be for a long time. Currently, we're about 1,300 years before present day Diablo 3. Now, the Viz Jaktar, who henceforth I'll refer to simply as assassins, since I'm not entirely sure I'm even pronouncing that correctly, were a secretive order founded by none other than wait for it, the Vigeri. Vigeri. Their purpose? To hunt down and destroy rogue mages. Hmm, yeah. I'm sure it's totally cool that the most powerful mage clan ever is the only one to really retain any semblance of power, and it ensures that no competitors arise through a secret order of uber assassins. Uber assassins. Would those be uber drivers who are also assassins, or assassins that only kill uber drivers. Now the assassins follow a strict code, which is based upon passages from Lam Essen's tome, aka the Black Book of Lam Essen. This is actually a quest item that you have to retrieve in Diablo 2's third act. Now we'll talk a little bit more about Lam Essen and his tome in a bit, because next we need to discuss Akarat. Yep, the very same Akarat that the Crusader won't shut up about. Now, a fact that may surprise some of you is that Akrat came from Shansai, meaning he may have looked something like this. Shansai is an island in Northern Sanctuary, this island right here. Due to its remote nature, the island's culture developed largely free of outside influence. Jan society is largely controlled by competing great families that each control a portion of the kingdom's economy. You know, kind of like rival gangs sectioning off their turf. And the Jan people worship a pantheon of 59 deities. That's a lot of gods to keep track of. Fortunately, the only one they really care about is Zay, the trickster god. And they have many holidays in his honor that involve making a fool of yourself. I feel like there's a joke in here somewhere. But yes, that Zay is the very same Zay from Zay's Stone of Vengeance, 
the legendary gem in Diablo 3, which is fitting since it's named after the legendary thief, Zay, before he ascended to godhood. And it's strongly implied that in Diablo 3, covetous Shen is actually Zay just being Trixie, that little scoundrel. But back to Akrat himself. He was said to be a kind man, a selfless man, a compassionate man. Who said this? We don't know. It may have been Akrat himself. He was an ascetic that joined an order that sought enlightenment through peace and meditation. Sort of like Buddhism. One night, during a particularly deep meditation session, he had a vision. An angel named Yarius, or Son of Light in Akrat's native tongue, revealed to Akrat the tenets upon which would eventually be founded the Zakarum faith. These tenets stress the need to resist evil and completely embrace the light. The light being a force used by angels and, in later history, holy men such as paladins, crusaders, and templars. The angel appointed Akrat to be the prophet of these teachings, and asked him to travel the lands to spread the word. And so Akrat did. He set out on a grand journey, sailing south to Kejistan, going from city to city, bringing with him the teachings of the light. Imagine that. Imagine having a dream one night in which some mysterious stranger <laughs> tells you to go preach about some new religion, and you drop everything and devote your life to that. And when you're telling people about this new faith, and someone asks you, Hey, how'd you find out about this? You reply with, Oh, someone told me in a vision. It's difficult to get people to buy what you're selling. But Akrat must have had 18 charisma because he built up a following. Now, the capital of Kejistan was previously Vizhun, but that city was destroyed during the Mage Clan Wars. So the new capital at the time of Akrat's arrival was Kurast, the town hub in Diablo 2 Act 3. And the people of Kurast embraced Akrat's teachings and they sent disciples throughout Kejistan to spread the word. And eventually, Akrat was satisfied that he had spread the word of the light to as many people as he reasonably could, and so he disappeared into the jungles of Kejistan, never to be seen again. Or would he? No. No, he would not. And who can blame him? Those jungle maps in Diablo 2 were always so convoluted. Now, in the years after his disappearance, Akrat's message lived on, preached by a few devout followers of his. Akrat had never set out to create an organized religion. He had never given a name to his faith. But eventually, the term Zakarum came to be used to describe followers of his ideals. Because the word Zakara means inner light. And so... The Zakarum follow the ideals of Zakara. And yes, the Diablo 3 item spawners of Zakara are a reference to this. And that explains why they glow with inner light. If only they were actually useful. Now, while Akarat's teachings had left their mark on Kejistan, it would be a thousand years before his religion really got off the ground. So we'll revisit that in a bit. For now, let's return to talking about Lam Essen. That's the dude who wrote that book that the assassins use as scripture. So Lam Essen was an ancient sage who studied the effects of the prime evils on Sanctuary, as well as Skatsimi magic. Now, Skatsim, aka the Old Religion, was an old religion practiced in Kejistan. Ormus, an NPC that you meet in Diablo 2's Act 3, was a follower of the Skatsim religion, which was one of the most widely practiced religions prior to the rise of Zakarum, which hasn't happened yet. Again, give it a thousand years. So Lam Essen compiled his research into a massive tome. His life's work, like a PhD thesis. The assassins used this tome as a basis for their honor code, or whatever. But when Zakurum would overtake Skatsim as the prevailing religion, Lam Essen's tome became known as the Black Book due to its dark contents. It was seen as heretical, blasphemous, and the Zakurum hid it in a ruined temple to be lost forever. That is, until you retrieve it in the Kurast Bazaar in Diablo 2. Now, there's one last topic that I want to discuss today. A loose end that we left from last video. The Mage Clan Wars ended with the climactic battle between Mage Brothers Horazon and Bartok. Horazon had killed his brother, a battle that had begun with a lifelong philosophical divide between the two. They were both Vigeri mages, Vigerite. and they both actively summoned demons into Sanctuary. However, Bartok believed it was best to ally yourself with the demons, whereas Horazon believed it was best to enslave the demons. Now, once the political power of the mage clans had been shattered, and Horazon no longer had any allies to support him, he started to become concerned about what would happen if some vengeance-seeking demons 
would come for him. So within an old Vigeri fortress, Vigeri. he built himself a magical dimension known as the Arcane Sanctuary, which we visit in Diablo 2. Here he continued his magical practices of summoning and enslaving demons, believing himself safe from any interference from the Burning Hells. Eventually, the city of Loot Golane, Diablo 2's Act 2 town hub, would be unknowingly built over a portal to the Arcane Sanctuary. But what would ultimately become of Horizon? What effect would the rise of the Zakarum faith have on Sanctuary? And perhaps most alarmingly, why haven't we heard about Diablo in a while? All these questions and more will be answered as we continue to explore this Diablo lore series. Stay tuned. And until then, be sure to get caught up on past episodes. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch and Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider becoming a Royal Raider by pledging on Patreon, where your support is immensely appreciated. We've got a variety of backer rewards, including behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.